Sister! You don't listen, do you? Where are you? Get out of here now! Deep in the dark, your kiss will thrill me Like days of old Lighting the spark of love that fills me With dreams of time Upload Hello and welcome to Most Unwanted, an X-Files podcast. I'm Chex, I'm joined by Luke. Luke, how are you today? I'm not bad, I'm not too bad today. Very subdued. As a Why are you subdued? I don't know, just sick of working. <laughs> 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 subdued is not the attitude you want from a podcast host, Luke. Do you know what though, this episode will perk me up, as will this Monster Energy drink, uh, who I'm hoping will sponsor us one day maybe. <laughs> it... Monster, if you are listening, get in touch. We will we will sell out. Yeah. As long as you I mean, you don't even have to pay us, just send us lots a few drinks and we'll sell out everything. We don't mind. <laughs> yeah. We'll call this show the Monster Show. <laughs> the Monster Monster of the Week. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that that is actually not a bad episode. <laughs> like a show name, to be fair. Well, Questions with the boys. Questions, questions with the boys. After the chase in the sunset, one of life's simple choices. Questions with the boys. We've got we've got a lot to talk about today. Um, but we will start off with questions with the boys. I was trying to think of questions related to this episode. And it's difficult. I, the only one I could come up with was for you, Luke. Yeah. What's your What's your earliest memory of using the internet? My earliest memory. See, the internet. I can't remember too much. I remember the first computer that we got um, because we we got a Time computer. Do you remember Time? Time. Yeah. yeah. They were like a. I think they were kind of like Dell. Um, back in two thousand, I remember okay. we, we we had like they gave us like an AOL disc. This was back when to to have the internet, you had to install like the AOL software and all this stuff. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um. So I do remember that. I remember my first email address was somewhat ridiculous. Um. I can't even. I I I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I'm sure it was some kind of like anime character or something like that. I think I can guess it. Yeah. Do you still use it? Are you waiting for me to put it out in the world? I mean, maybe not, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> this is cancel territory right here. <laughs> um, not cancel, I'll be all right. I just might end up being signed up to some some bad, uh, what's it, stuff, I don't what's know. What sites would you be signed up to, Lou? I don't know. There's a lot of bad sites on the internet, <laughs> let's let's be frank. <laughs> um yeah, I, I can't remember the exact first time I went on the internet. Do you know what? If one of the earliest memories I remember was like um, when you're stuck on a game, uh, and this was the first time you're like, I can go on the internet and find out how to do this thing. So it was probably on like game FAQs. Uh, yeah, I, I remember I used that a lot. I remember I I printed off the guide to beat Final Fantasy X. Uh, and it was, it must have used up an entire pack of A4 paper. Um, it was so <laughs> big. It was ridiculous. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably one of the early, probably not the first, but probably one of the earliest. How about you? I specifically remember, again, similar story. I was getting a family computer. I remember my dad being like, um, like really sort of obsessed with it for a couple of weeks. Do you know what I mean? Like just, like you couldn't do anything on it. You'd like it, you'd look over. You'd be playing solitaire all the time, stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But I always remember there was like a chat room, and it was like it was proper basic stuff. It was like everyone in like you could just get put into a random chat room, and everyone was in the same room. There was no no one knew who anything was. You didn't have to sign up to it. It was like bare bones, and I just remember like the excitement. Of, around the house, around the family, of just saying hi to someone that you just never met before. Yeah. And I, I always remember, like, all of us sat around. Like, it was such a, such a weird time, but we all sat around the computer going, oh, 
What, who, who's this? Who, who's saying hi back? It's so crazy. Yeah, I know. They, I remember the first time you used to t- talk to people, uh, yeah, just online, like, and uh, I, th- there's, there's like memories I've got of that, like, of talking to people and being like, I wonder what they're doing now. Like, you know, yeah. like, and I've never, I have no idea who they are, or never met them, don't even know the names of half the people, but yeah, you just think, I wonder what they're doing. You saying about game FAQs as well. God, I used to be on like the the forums and everything, mm. and like used to, I used to log in every day to um to make sure that I, there was like a a point system that you got. I can't remember what it was mm. called. Karma. It was called Karma. Yeah, yeah. You have to log in and like do certain activities to get your karma up and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every day, I, I used to think I was so helpful to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> there's loads of stuff like that though like early social networks and stuff like that you'd be so obsessive about who's your I know MySpace and I think it was Bebo as well I used to use Bebo a lot it was like who's in your top friends that was yeah. that was an obsession more for teenagers I suppose but I, I, I remember when I first got um, Bebo and there was like a little penguin that you could feed oh <laughs> I yeah feed, I used to feed the penguin every day like what what was we doing It's it just it, it screams novelty, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's the thing. It was just new. So you just didn't, yeah. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that, I think. But it must have been, like, I know a lot of people, like, got into the internet, like, in America was, like, in the 90s, where, for me, that was just not a thing till like, the, the two, early 2000s, I think. It's, it's weird how late we had it, I suppose. It's, like, an everyday thing, anyway. That's the thing. And it wasn't accessible either, was it? No, no. So, like, it, it was just, like, it blows my mind, really, when I think back, and it wasn't that long ago that it was one computer per household, mm. if that, if you were lucky, and that even then, it was, like, dial-up internet, you couldn't be on the internet when you had, when you were on the phone and stuff yeah, like that, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's really strange, it's crazy how how far things have come. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, because it's just literally now I've got internet on. Uh, three devices that are literally in front of me right now. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's definitely drawn into like straight away. It's sort of you can see the contrast in this episode when she gets a laptop from the back seat mm. and she just boots up into the internet in the car. And I'm just like, there's no way, there is no <laughs> way she'd be able to do that. She, maybe she's got some kind of like satellite uplink. Who knows? It's, it's, it's the government, man. It's the government. <laughs> yeah. they, had this in, they had this in the 70s. Uh, apparently they had technology that, that Scully wasn't aware of, so <laughs> who knows? <laughs> um, I can't think of a second question, um, but I think we did enough on that first question. I think that's fine. Yeah. This week we're going to be looking at season five, episode eleven, titled "Kill Switch." Mm-hmm. Um, it originally aired February fifteenth, nineteen ninety-eight, and was written by William Gibson and Tom Maddox. Mm. I don't remember seeing these names before. Have we seen? Have these guys wrote an episode before? Not for X Files, but William Gibson is quite a famous sci-fi writer. Oh, okay. I have not. I don't know him. I'm not by name anyway. Yeah. Would, uh, anything I know? Um, he wrote uh, Neuromancer, which was like kind of like the first cyberpunk story. Okay. So he's kind of like the the father of cyberpunk, I guess. So, um, interesting. But That's I've, a, I've, quite I've, a claim to fame. Yeah, I've never read it, but yeah, I knew knew the name as soon as it said William Gibson. I was like, oh. And then seeing the episode, you're like, ah, yeah, this is <laughs> this is quite William Gibson. <laughs> well, this, I mean, last week you mentioned that you thought this episode um, might, yeah, I remember you saying that you seem to remember this episode being on the list of like not very good episodes. Mm-hmm. I think I was wrong. Well, did, is that based, did you, do you think that you was wrong about lists or do you think that you just like it more than other um, people? Uh, maybe a bit of both. I don't know. Personally, I thought this was quite a good episode to uh, to sort of spoil my <laughs> my thoughts on it uh, right at the beginning. No, no, that's fair. Enough. I think I think we can. That's good because we can go through it and sort of pick out the reasons why you liked it. Yeah. Um, a little spoiler for myself. I really liked it too. Like yeah. way more. I think I liked it way more than I should like it. If yeah. I'm being honest. Uh, um, yeah. So we'll get straight into it then. Um. So at the start, it's a very strange start. We basically get this um, amalgamation of all these different scenes of basically all these different gangs 
in this in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, where was the city again? Does it does it say? Uh, I can't remember where the city's no. actually based. Yeah, I can't either. I'm not even sure whether it said. But anyway, um, all these different gangs. So you've got like a biker gang. You've got um, like a sort of mafia type gang. They're all getting these calls, and they're all basically being told that someone that they've had contact with, or, they, or they've got problems with, or they've got issues with, is going to be at this cafe at this time. <laughs> yeah, they um, it, it's quite an intriguing start, to be fair, because you, you don't actually know what the point of all this is. Uh, and I thought that was quite a strength of this episode, is it, it, it's, it's quite a pure detective story. There's a lot of detecting that they have to do in it, um, mixed in with this kind of like crazy... Um, sci-fi story I guess um, but yeah it, it really does leave you in the lurch and not you don't know what's um, what the point of all these things are up until the moment that it happens and then it's like yeah it all falls into place but um, apparently it's it's in Washington DC this, this oh, opening okay. was I, yeah I know later though in Virginia so it yeah. makes sense um, do you want to hear my hot take on this episode go for it this is very I, I thought all the way through it reminded me so much of early James Bond. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, to be fair, yeah. That sort of very almost camp, over-the-top um, mm. action film. Yeah. But like you say, with that spy element, with that detective element, yeah. I really enjoyed it. And do you want to know my second hot take? Is this the hotter take? This is a controversial hot oh, take. Oh, my word. Okay. Right? For, for all those out there that like Marvel and Marvel films... I think this villain was better than Ultron. Hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> like, honestly, like I know it's I know it's silly, and I know it's like of its time, and I know it's also. But this, it, I like the idea that they went, okay, what would happen if the if uh, the internet was out to get you? And they were so much more creative with it than yeah. Ultron was in, yeah. in in this big studio production that made billions of pounds. Yeah, for I mean, for for a completely unseen villain. It's so um, sinister, and it's sort of that it can always track you. It always knows where you are. All it needs is like the slightest amount of connectivity to the to the out, outside world, I suppose. And it knows exactly where you are. Knows how to kill you, or knows how to get to you, and stuff like that. It, it as a villain, like I said, it, that's you will never see because I mean it's yeah. code in a computer. Um, yeah, it's it's really really good. Uh, it's, it's it's the world it's out to get you, isn't it? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, and yeah, don't get me wrong, I know it's goofy, and I know there's a few scenes here that are really goofy, but I actually think that adds to it, because if you took it too seriously, then it would be, it would, it would, it would be awful if you took it seriously. It'd be mm. so cringy. The fact that it's like got this little goofy edge to it, I think it's perfect. So yeah. anyway, that's the hot takes out of the way. <laughs> um, we'll get to the reasons why we think that as the, we get along. They'll cool down into our actual takes by the end of the show. <laughs> And then right at the end, when we look back, we'll go through our leftover takes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are, This is very much post Christmas now. We are very much into the leftover period. Exactly. Yeah. It's all leftover takes at this point. Um, so, yes, um, all these guys turn up at this diner and it becomes clear that... No one is there. The, the people that they've turned up to, to see isn't there. They've all just been sort of coaxed into going to this diner at the same time. Um, at the same time, there's also this guy in the diner um, tapping away at a computer. He seems to be quite sinister. We don't really know what he's up to, but it looks like he's trying to hack into something. Yeah. He's getting the password wrong. Um, once everyone's in the diner, he finally gets the password right, and then he panics because... The it, basically the whole place gets raided, mm-hmm. and there's a huge shootout between um, all the gangs and all the uh, these marshals that, that have come in, and basically everyone dies. Yeah. But as it's happening, he panics that it's happening. Not not I don't think because of his life, more because he's just finished what he was doing, and he's like, not now. I need this mm-hmm. time. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't get it because everyone dies in this gun battle and that's yeah. the intro yeah um really good intro like i said it's because you can see what's happening as it starts unfolding you see that these criminals have all been lured here by this anonymous person um and as have the like the marshals uh, and as you see them all coming in and realizing nobody's here 
They've all been sent. You realize that this guy's been set up to be killed in this crossfire, and it's like, oh, okay, this is this is going to take a bit of uh, a bit of working out of what the actual plot is. And I I I really thought that it did keep you um, one step behind what it was always intending. I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you're not even sure whether the gangs were the um, targets of this mm-hmm. attack or yeah. whether he it was all specifically set up for him. Mm-hmm. Um. As we come out of the intro, um, Mulder and Scully are both there, and we learn a little bit more about this guy. His name's Donald Gelman, mm-hmm. and Mulder mentions that he is um, one of the earliest sort of um, creators of the internet. Um, he's up there with sort of Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. He's with that sort of crew, but he just never. Basically, he went missing just before it sort of hit its went into stratosphere with all this all the, with the, the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's uh, the impression we get from him is he's just as much responsible as those guys, but never really got the applaud for, yeah. for, for it. Or, or uh, the way I took it is it that he was sort of didn't want to become like a capitalist, so to speak. You know, and he yeah, they do mention that, yeah, don't they? Yeah. yeah. So, so he was always this sort of pioneer and kind of like a. It's I literally only just thought of this, but it's kind of like a Frankenstein's monster kind of story. He's a bit scared of his own creation. Um, Very good point, actually. Uh, that yeah, he sort of disappears from it, and then yeah, we find out that he's trying to take it down. Essentially, we find that later on, but um, yeah, but then doesn't get to and gets killed by his by his own monster. Um, Very sadly, yes. Um, Mulder kind of suspects that he's been brought there for some reason he doesn't know what yet um but he what he does is he, he steals the laptop that he was using he sneaks evidence uh, under his coat and they find a cd um in the laptop and much to scully's disapproval he <laughs> yeah. puts the cd uh, does he put it into the cd player yeah which is strange because like, you, you you wouldn't think that any date on there is going to be like all oh, this must be an MP3. But yeah. this, this is like the time when um, I had Tekken One on the PlayStation. I was like, this would never work in a CD player, and it did. It played the music. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, much on the same level, uh, I like to think. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, on the on the scale of importance, that's it's up there. It's up yeah. there. Um, but it does work. He puts it into the CD player. And it starts playing um, music. It starts playing a song, Twilight Time, by the Platters. Mm-hmm. And um, sort of they share a wry smile as... I'm not sure whether... Did it take over the car? Uh, not that Because I'm... the light started flashing um, in time to the music. Oh, I didn't even notice that, no. I, I Yeah, I, I didn't notice that, but I, it would make sense that it sort of had some kind of... I don't know. It might be a coincidence, yeah. if I'm being completely honest, because Maybe. like it was just flashing lights. It could just be like sort of hazard lights. I'm not sure. Yeah. But it seemed like the car was like it all started when the CD player went in. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I did like this again. It, it feels like since the last two series, they've been using a lot more like licensed music uh, in stuff. <laughs> yeah, they have. Yeah, uh, and they. It never feels forced in, you know what I mean? Like it always feels like it's there for a purpose, and it add, especially in this uh, episode, it definitely adds to the story. Especially by the end, when you you sort of get the final sort of shot with that music, you go, "Oh, that this is the 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 reason for it existing." Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this um, sort of use of the music. Anyway, yeah, I definitely think it adds to it for for sure. And it's not like like we say, it's not just this one. There's been a quite a few instances, especially of the last few seasons. Mm. Um, it, just, it just goes to show that at this point, they were, and I, I do hear like season three, four, five, six, they're the sort of the glory years of the X-Files. And it just goes to show that how much favor they got from those first couple of seasons and how yeah. much more they were trusted. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think it's just that case of, yeah. When you go from strength to strength, you sort of, um, yeah, they they get offered a lot more budget allows for these optional extras where before uh, licensed music is the lowest on the scale of things that, that they'd offer you. But yeah, um, now it's yeah, it's using a lot more episodes. 
Oh, well, not even just that. We see later on in this episode <laughs> that they get budget for effects as well, which is um, yeah. interesting. There's a lot in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we don't know what this CD is. We don't know what it entails. There's only one place you'd want to take it, and that's to the lone gunman. It is. So they take this CD to, to, to the lone gunman, and they're fascinated by it. They're basically they're talking about um, much what we've said about um, Donald and basically where he's just he doesn't need. That's this is where they mention that he wasn't really a capitalist himself. He didn't want to be involved in that, but he did create. He was like he almost like a hero to them. He created like viruses and stuff like that. That he he knows what he's doing. Basically, is what they're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, something something's out to get him uh, and obviously at this point we don't know it's a computer program but I guess that's the only thing that could <laughs> sort of take him down is, is his own creation yeah and but they can't figure this out because they can't crack into the system mm-hmm. um, and it's only Scully that um, has the idea to just check his emails <laughs> and maybe there's something in there yeah. and there is there is uh, again I do love this old school sort of email system that he had um, very AOL in it yeah, yeah, and um, they do find an email, and it's basically um, from someone called Invisigoth, and Invisigoth um, has sent him her code, which Mulder quickly deciphers as a ID number for a shipping container. Mm-hmm. So that gives them nice and easy. They know where they're going next, and they end up going to this container yard and find this Invisigoth, um, which is... Basically, just a, a hacker, would you call that? Yeah, just a goth hacker, basically. Yeah, yeah armed with a taser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you one thing about this scene, though. It's so bloody dark. Oh, it was, wasn't it? It was really dark. <laughs> this All you could see was the bloody taser um, <laughs> lightning bolt thing. Yeah. Um, as I was watching, I was like, yeah, I think he's got a point, actually. This program is quite dark. <laughs> <laughs> this is... To be fair, in this episode, this is the only bit I had, I had an issue with. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't see anything else that was too dark that I couldn't see, but this one was a little bit, like, just kept shapes moving on the screen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, overall, though, I, I like this sort of setup. It looked cool, actually, like, going into this, like, shipping container, and then, lo and behold, there's actually a person in this shipping container um, who, <laughs> yeah, is sort of using it as their base. Um, it's, it's incredibly... Um, uh, what's the word? Do you know those like type of people who uh, are completely outside of the system? They're like off grid. Yeah, off yeah. the grid. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's basically sort of the, what the vibe they were going to go for. Her name we find out later is Esther, mm-hmm. um, and I love the fact that it's Esther. And then, well, we need to make her goth. What do we do? Put a load of eyeshadow on. Yeah. <laughs> like way too much yeah. eyeshadow. That's she's, what we need to do. Yeah, she's wearing like this like kind of leathery sort of I don't even know what the, the word is for it. It's like this corset kind of thing, isn't it? Mm. Um uh and yeah, the the the, the black eyeshadow around it. It's just yeah, it's incredibly um over the top. But I've gotta say, as a one off character, I thought this was one of the best one off characters we've had um yeah. in in the series so far. She's brilliant. She was fun. This. She was fun. Yeah. Very Sarah Connor. Uh, I got in a. Do you know Sarah Connor Terminator Two? Yeah, I, I get that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, I think you're spot on there. Yeah, because um, she's got that like again. Uh, uh, the, 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 we'll see a lot more of it later, but she's got that kind of cocky kind of attitude. But then later on, you see a lot more of a uh, emotional uh, weight behind it and the reasons why she's doing a lot of these things. Um, yeah, I, I just thought she's brilliant in this episode. Yeah, I, I I do agree. I, like I say, I don't want to sort of give really sort of exaggerate how much praise I'm giving because I do understand it is goofy. And I keep using that word, but I can't think of any better word to use. It is very sort of early 80s action films. You know what I mean? It's very sort of over the top. But I think that works, and they then they absolutely buy into it yeah. as well, which it, it works for this story. Um. So yeah, I will recap it for the people that couldn't see it because it was so bloody dark. Um, she tries. She basically tases both um, Mulder and Scully. She tries to get away, and Scully finally, with the with a shot, a warning shot from a gun, 
she apprehends um, this Invisigoth and um, takes her back to the container where it's filled with all these computers and it just looks all these servers, very sort of tech vibe, yeah, uh, very, very hackery. That's very the matrix. That's the matrix. This is like the matrix. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it all looks like the matrix. And, and that's basically, that was late eighties, early nineties. That was the look that you, you assumed any tech savvy mm. person to have. Which it, it's funny. Cause I'm pretty sure the matrix took a lot of its sort of like, story beats from William Gibson novels. Oh, okay. Um, interesting. Or, or, or took the inspiration from it. So it is, it's interesting to see his vision of that. And then like a few years later, the matrix vision of this like hacker world as well. Isn't it interesting now that like hackers and sort of people who are using the internet for like nefarious reasons are always sort of seen to be on like, tiny devices like they're never they're never in a big server room are mm. they anymore it's always like they've just hacked you by the watch <laughs> it's it, it's kind of flipped now that um we've got more understanding of the technology mm, yeah yeah it's um yeah back in back in the day it was yeah yeah they were flashing there. lights yeah. in the back in the day wasn't it yeah, yeah pretty much so yeah they they're talking to her but quite quickly she gets distracted by her screens and she Starts to panic a little bit, and she believes that um, basically there's a Department of Defense satellite, is what she says, that's locked onto their location and is sending a drone or a missile mm-hmm. their way. Yeah. It all sounds very far fetched. Scully's not buying it for a second. But after Mulder has a look, he kind of gets convinced of this, mm-hmm. and he convinces Scully to let's just get out of here, let's just, let's just leave. They get in the car. Scully is really dragging her feet here. Yeah. And, um, but they do revert, manage to reverse out, out of the container. And then we see this container, this massive explosion as this missile hits it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it, it's funny because last week, obviously, we had Scully as uh, being the main believer in, in what, like these extreme per, uh, possibilities. Uh, and then this week, we go back to her being. There's no such thing as a satellite about to shoot us. You know, I mean? like she's so like skeptical of, to the point where, yeah, she has to sort of be dragged, not dragged, but you know, she sort of dragged her heels uh, as a missile hits <laughs> the, the container. So it is interesting to, to sort of get this back and forth. But again, maybe she's gone back to, whilst Mulder's here for the, the unbelievable stuff, she's here to ground it. And yeah. Yeah. I also think we're a victim of the time we're watching this now as well yeah, yeah. because like okay for example if i told you that there's a satellite in the sky that's run by the government that can shoot missiles that doesn't seem like a stretch at all that's, that seems like yeah I've, and i'm pretty much they can scully do that. later yeah <laughs> exactly and scully later describes it as impossible she doesn't just describe it as we don't have a satellite. She says that actually that we don't need that technology doesn't exist. Um, mm. So I think it's a little bit difficult for us to sort of understand. Maybe it wouldn't hit as hard um, when we watched it, if we watched it back in sort of 94, 95, whenever this came out, mm. but maybe it would have, maybe it would seem like very unbelievable at that point. Yeah. Um, it, it is difficult. And because you, you try and, I try and go back to because what's this ninety eight? I'm not sure. I can't remember. I did say earlier. Think, it's yeah, it's ninety eight. February fifteenth, nineteen eighty eight. I, I was like seven at the time, so it's I'm trying to, in my head to try and remember um, what was like um, in the news at the time. You don't really pay attention to it at that that age, do you? So I don't know what would have been like believable or unbelievable then. So yeah, it, it is difficult to sort of go back to then and think. Would this be far fetched, or would this be, you know, what I mean, like, yeah, it, it is. It's hard to place yourself in that time. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And so, but I still think it works, and I mm-hmm. still think, yes, I know Scully was saying sort of it's impossible or whatnot, but it kind of, it's kind of still works. And her being sort of skeptical of it puts us into that mindset. So it kind of works on two levels there. Mm-hmm. Um, as they're transporting. Um, I keep on calling you in Vitigoth, but her name is Esther. Mm. Um, as they're transporting her back, this is where we sort of get a little bit of exposition. No more screwing around. We need a name. Your real name. 
In Visigoth. You want my address? It's T O A S T. When you said it was targeting us back there, you meant an artificial intelligence. Donald Gelman was trying to create a sentient AI a program with its own consciousness. He succeeded, didn't he? Donald wrote an interlocking sequence of viruses 15 years ago. It got loose on the net. Wait, what do you mean got loose? He let it loose. So it could evolve in its natural environment. Urschlime and silicon. Urschlime and silicon? The primordial slime. The ooze out of which all life evolved. Except this time it's artificial slime. Artificial life. One man alone achieving the equivalent of Copernicus, Magellan, and Darwin. What was your role in all this? Were you the bass player? Dar- very Darwinian, which is like this. She, I think she describes it as a slime yeah. that's been released into the wild and just been allowed to evolve over time. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, because she like likens it to what is it called, the primordial ooze, is it or, or something? Yeah, like that's that. what she says. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you get this kind of like so they they've created this early like learning AI and it's now <laughs> matured past what even they thought and it's become much more um of a problem um yeah it always seems to be the way doesn't it with these ai stories they're always like it, it won't turn on us and it's like yeah, they always do they always do <laughs> they need to learn but that's the thing no one does learn that's the yeah. thing um she goes on to sort of explain what what this thing's trying to achieve um she believes that donald was close to creating or has created um almost like a vaccine for this virus um it he's called it kill switch and basically it's an antivirus that will root out and kill wherever wherever this sort of program is it will find and destroy it Mm -hmm. um and that's why she thinks that instead of sending missiles the program sent drug dealers and this was interesting she said Scully asked, why didn't you just send a missile to kill him? And she says, well, he's showing off his sense of humour. Mm. So we're kind of getting this hint that this AI has a personality. Yeah. It's not just performing tasks. It's actually sort of thinking and telling jokes and sort of showing off. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's not just being a logical, like, machine. Uh, yeah, because obviously if you're a machine, you just go, what's the easiest way to, to take this person out? But yeah, if it's thinking of creative ways to kill people, then it's at least got some kind of intuition into something else other than just yeah a, a machine like thinking. So yeah, it is interesting at this point that you sort of learn that there's more to it, and we see a lot more of that later as well in the, the manipulation scenes with with uh, Mulder. We certainly do using like this sort of VR VR technology, which is really interesting. I really like that. Um, she does explain that she can't log into the internet or she can't phone anybody because it can track her voice or it can track her, her sort of signature wherever she goes. So they can't upload it onto the internet. The only way they can kill it is by tracking down the computer that it's like based on. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's sort of holding on yeah. um, and then destroying that computer. Yeah. It's like, it's nested somewhere like an animal. It's nested somewhere and they need to just go to the nest basically now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, this is, is this the bit where um, I, I haven't wrote it down in my notes, but is this the bit where they go back to the lone gunman? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What my favourite scene? It can't be. It is, Mister Naren. You program the autonomous bots in Ninjutsu Princess. It's the most gnarliest piece of entertainment software ever. Are these the brain donors that nearly got us incinerated? Don't let their looks fool you. Your name is Esther Naren. She is so hot. Are you going to take off these cuffs, or do I have to do this with my tongue? You don't want to take a vote. And the lone gunman's face. Honestly, for Hickey, he just would not get away with this. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like Mulder's response as well. I said, I wouldn't take a vote on that. <laughs> just like to know. <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want to know. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, again, it's, it's uh, it shows a bit more of attitude from this this person that she's... Um, she's got this like sass that she she's just like I want to do my job. I just want to get on with this, and you know what I mean. Like I I really like this sort of personality, this character. Again, it reminded me a lot at this point. Um, how like Sarah Connor like she is. Um, 
Yeah. They do a good job of making it very clear that she's the smartest person in the room as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, to, to even to the point where it becomes kind of annoying, you know what I mean? Like, cause like, uh, I love this character, but there's, there's points where she's very abrasive in that she's like, oh, I'm not going to explain this. She won't understand it. You know what I mean? That kind of like, yeah. um, yeah, uh, again, it, it's such a multifaceted character. It's not just cool badass. She's also kind of a know it all, but also has this, yeah, this, uh, underlying emotional story. And again, it's, it's, it's really well written. Hey, but talking about a cool badass she's not the most cool badass in this episode we will get to who who get, gets to claim that crown oh yeah i was a bit confused then i was like who? oh okay <laughs> we we will get to it um <laughs> so we start to start to really start to ramp up now and um they figure out that the only way they can even possibly find where this computer is located is they know that he oh, this i keep on saying he like i don't know how to describe this program but they know that the program must be using uh, what they call a t3 line yeah yeah that's which is basically just yeah. like a, a high bandwidth line yeah to to be able to control as much as he does and the only people that have that which i think he said like 50 megabytes which yeah. is like the only people that can have that is a government yeah. <laughs> like, I, okay. I, I remember when like programs used to ask like oh what kind of connection speed and there was like t3 and it was like like 50 megabytes and you're like whoa imagine having that uh even up <laughs> it's like yeah t3 lines you can get them installed at like any office now it's like yeah. not it's yeah. not a deal <laughs> but all in it at this point in time only the government and if only they knew a government official that could help uh, as they all stare at Mulder. Yeah. and he he does he goes out to investigate and he actually finds one which really easily like it takes no work whatsoever it leads them to this sort of abandoned caravan site in the middle of nowhere where there is a caravan that looks suspicious <laughs> like yeah. there's no other word for it it just looks it's a very suspicious looking caravan yeah. and it just completely just out of the blues there's just a caravan there i mean i'd be suspicious of that so yeah i mean <laughs> it it def- definitely doesn't look good um he calls um scully and lets lets her know what's going on um and whilst this is happening, Scully is going with um, Invisigoth to find out um, another man called David Markham, who she says was is, she works with him, and she they, they also both worked um, on this program as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, she actually takes. It's really strange. I don't really know why they added this scene because she takes over. Oh no, that's the reason why they go is because she. Um, Pulls a gun on Scully, doesn't she? And yeah. She manages to sort of flip the tables and yeah. Cause they, turn Scully away. They all seem to go to sleep, and then when Scully uh, sort of uh, enters the the room, yeah, she just got out of her handcuffs and yeah, pulls her. She she even drops like a, a what's it um a Spanish line, kind of like Sarah Connor, and I, I did. Yeah, think it's it, it's very sort of like I said, eighties action. Yeah, yeah. It's very. What does she say now? Uh, Something like Hola Muchachos or something like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, brilliant. So, yeah, at gunpoint, sorry, Scully is forced to drive her to this guy, David Markham, his name is. Um, but what they find is this, what looks like a missile has hit hit the site. It's just yeah. a destroyed house, a crater in the, in, the, in the earth. Yeah, yeah. And this is where we get more of the, re- <laughs> the, the, the history between these two characters, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, so Scully manages to escape and is about to sort of turn the gun and turn the situation around in her favour, but she doesn't need to. Esther, Esther basically says, it's fine, I don't need it, I don't yeah. need anything. Put me out of my misery even and gives her the gun. And she explains that what the plan was, This I, don't, I, I might get this a little bit wrong, I might butcher it a little bit. The plan was for her and this David, who uh, we now know was in a relationship, was to upload themselves and enter into the AI that was created. Yeah, that that's base basically what it is. Kind of like um that Black Mirror episode, I guess, so they could just live on forever, like together. Yeah, I'm not sure whether they take control of the AI or whether they just live inside it. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm not I'm I'm not sure w- which way around it was, but yeah, their their goal was to just live forever in this computer, I guess. Because we I think we'll have to assume, and we are jumping ahead, but I think we'll have to assume that David has already 
uploaded himself into this AI. Yeah. But it doesn't, the AI is still acting maliciously. So it doesn't seem like he's in control of it or he's like living as the AI. It just feels like he's living within the AI. Yeah, basically. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, that, that that's the vibe I got as well. Yeah, as yeah, it's basically they they thought they were in control of this, but it's all spun out and now, yeah, I guess he's kind of trapped in there. Yeah. So we jump back to Mulder now, and a very interesting scene. He manages to break into this caravan, finds David there, strapped up and sort of. Look, look, basically looks dead. I'm not sure whether he is he, dead, but he, he looks look, it. He looks like one of the Borg from Star Trek. Do you know those like robot people in Star yeah. Trek? He looks yeah, like yeah. that. It, it does. It, it doesn't look. It kind of doesn't look real. It looks. Um, but he looks. His eyes are all glazed over. Mm. Like if he's not dead, he's been there a long time by the mm. by the looks of it. Um, and then all of a sudden, oh, I, what I will mention before we get into the story. Remember I said at the beginning how I liked how creative this all was? Mm. Stuff like this, stuff like this caravan, I thought was just did so much to create to build the world. So like this AI had created a, a doorbell so that when you press the doorbell to see who was there, it would take your fingerprints, it yeah. would download everything about you. Yeah. Like he managed to create this VR program that we're gonna talk about just in, in a little second based on the fact that it's read up everything on Mulder. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's it's as well with that sort of... Um, earlier on in the story, they, they kind of said, oh, if I call, it knows where I am, and it can find... That. So you've already had this sort of seed of, oh, it, it can find you no matter where you are. And yeah, uh, as soon as we see that, we realise what's happened. It's now read on... It, it, it Again, it's really well written that... We've already had these hints of its abilities dropped, and then as soon as it happens, you're like, oh, okay, no. And you can start seeing where it's going to go from there. Yeah. And even to the point where it's like it's got like little robots that are just driving around the caravan and sort yeah. of scouting ahead for, for this um, AI. Yeah. Um, but it manages to shock or like just push Mulder into this machine, straps him up, and. We don't know what's happened. All we know is, from that point forward, we see Mulder getting rushed into hospital. Mm. And it looks... I don't know whether you had the same impression as me. It looked very fake. Like, it, there was these sort of blonde, beautiful nurses that are like... I, I, not... Like, it just, it just felt like very imagination type yeah. thing. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, those sort of... The, the, long corridors, like the wide, wide corridors with like the the running lights that kept switching off as well. It just felt very dreamlike. Yeah, there's there's um there's a film called um, Jacob's Ladder, and it reminded me so much of mm. the scene. There's a scene in that where he first gets taken into hospital. Um, oh, when he gets taken into hospital, sorry, and it's everything feels dreamlike and like like you said, unreal. Um, and I know that film like is a massive inspiration on like do you know the Silent Hill games on how everything yeah yeah and that that's what this reminded me of so much I was like it's like a dark envisioning of what real life would be like if you yeah thought... Silent Hill is exactly what I felt yeah. as I was watching this it just it didn't all like sort of like like the old Bioshock games you yeah, know what I mean it just yeah. felt very much like like a dream like hospital mm, one yeah. and so I kind of already figured it out. Um, but Mulder hasn't yet. He's being rushed off to surgery, and he sort of comes to, he notices he's got these burn marks on his wrists where this could be plausible because we saw the sparks in the caravan. Yeah. And then as he's just about to go into surgery, the nurse holds his head down as they get this sore out. Yeah. Um, don't see anything from that point forward. We All we see is Mulder wake up, presumably sometime later, while the same nurse is there looking after him, and she says, "Well, you were lucky because you, they, they only had to take the the left, the left one." And as he opens the covers up, or takes the covers off, I should I say, he hasn't got a left arm. Mm. They've take, they've um, amputated his left arm. Yeah, um, it's such a good image. Um, in the, like, it, like it's horrifying, yeah, genuinely scary. It, exactly, like it, it, it feels like a nightmare, and like from the setting and everything, like we said, dreamlike. Like it's kind of like he's got these like nurses that would probably be in his dreams, I guess. And then like this, well, they're like they're like those sort of 
pinup models, aren't they? Yeah, like in the yeah. wartime nurses, like yeah. the sort of long gowns with the with the head, the, the you know, like the, the I don't know what you call them, like the little yeah. head things that they wear. It, it makes me wonder if this is kind of like meant to be cerebral in like they've sort of read up on him on like his fears and his I interests. Think that's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe his biggest fear is losing his limbs, you know what I mean? Like and they've sort of implanted this into his story. And like obviously we know he's a wo- uh, not a womanizer, not that kind of but you know what I mean he's like into his like smutty videos and magazines. So they've sort of amalgamated the the stuff that he loves to try and interest to, to make him believe and his biggest fears to make him fear what's gonna happen next. Yeah, yeah, I feel like it's it's very well again, very well done. It's kinda of, like we were saying earlier, that Silent Hill taking these like worst fears kind of things. It's yeah, it is really, really good, these these scenes are. Yeah. Well I'll I'll continue on with the Mulder story for now, and then we'll go. We'll figure out what Mulder, Scully's doing afterwards. So we find out that he's in like this sort of VR world. He's basically in this sort of virtual reality, mm-hmm. and um, he keeps waking up. And basically, these nurses start to be less and less subtle, and they start to sort of threaten him. You poor thing. But I warned you, Nurse Nancy warned you. You have to tell the Fox. You have to. Tell them what? About the kill switch. Nobody asked me anything. You've just forgotten, Fox. No. I was there. The doctor asked and he was very cross when you refused to answer. But he'll be here in just a few minutes and you can tell him then. <laughs> Otherwise, whoops, there go your legs. And then, before they do that, Scully enters and basically just kicks ass like yeah. she just starts it's proper like old kung fu movies where like she's just like in these like weird very staged fight choreography yeah. moments it, it's uh, I, I it's one of those things where it's like you can't believe you've seen it in the x-files and obviously because it's it's all set up in this like dream sequence essentially um it makes sense and it works but the the choreography in it is brilliant. Like uh, the the fact that they've got all this worked into this episode, it, it's absolutely mad that you're seeing this, but it works perfectly. It's very Buffy the Vampire, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just thought to myself as I was watching this, I couldn't help but think, how much fun was Gillian Anderson having filming this scene? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th- th- there's a good uh, production note on that. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, that, yeah. I just kept on thinking, like, God, that must be like. Imagine turning up to work one day and going, right. With you know all this sort of usual stuff that we're doing, thrown out the window. You're gonna you're gonna be in like this badass fight. Yeah. Um, and she ends up saving Mulder from all these nurses, but then turns on him and starts asking, "Where's the kill switch? Where's the kill switch?" And so what we f- figure out from that is that the AI is using the knowledge of Mulder that he trusts Scully against him. Yeah. That's yeah. that. It, it's created this version of Scully to try and get the answer from him. Mm-hmm. Um, all while this is happening, we see Scully and um, Invisigoth Esther trying to get to this sort of cabin, trying to save Mulder because um, he mentioned on the phone that he was going there and they get into a little bit of bother as well. When there's like, she, lo- she logs onto the laptop I don't know why she logs onto the laptop. I can't remember. I she know. logs onto it, and all of a sudden, the missile starts coming again, and she, they start to realise that, yes, it's going to happen to them. There's this whole scene on a bridge when they get onto a moving bridge, and then they're trapped. Mm. But what she does is she manages to, with the CD, she manages to put the CD onto the internet before throwing it over into the water, and the missile hits the laptop in the water, saving them, luckily. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, I really like this scene as well because again, it's it's a lot more um, subtle of an action scene compared to the last one, I guess. Um, but it's still this like cool image of like this. They're stuck on this bridge as it's rotating. Um, you, you can tell it's that there's a lot of planning gone into even just this scene um, yeah. uh, to get it right. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I thought this was really good as well to be uh, to be a bit more grounded as well after we've just had this like zany fight scene. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the the last part of this episode, we've got um, they actually do get to the to the caravan. Um, 
I, I love the fact that Scully climbs underneath in the hole where Mulder managed to get in yeah. and sees this robot, just, just puts four rounds into it, <laughs> just starts yeah. shooting this little tiny toy yeah. car. You can't mess around with this thing. It's very dangerous. <laughs> well, that's the thing, what you said earlier about, like, oh, the, uh, people always underestimate AI and, oh, yeah. it'll never happen to us. Not Scully. She's shooting any mechanical object in sight. Yeah. Bang, 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 as soon as she sees it. Yeah, she's... um. Do you know what? It's... It, I don't know what it is. It's any type of AI story, any type of killer robot story. It's always the women that kick ass. The guys are sh- shit. <laughs> it's always the women that, that, that like are the best in it. So there we go. Uh, just, if there's ever a robot revolution, look to your wife, your girlfriend, because we're useless. <laughs> I mean, it's not that. Just does, that doesn't just count for robot revolution. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, true, true. Um, they figure out that there's. A missile heading their way as well because it's show. I don't know why this AI keeps showing them on the screens that the missile's coming, <laughs> yeah. um, but it does, and they realise that there's a missile heading straight for them, and they've obviously found David and Mulder at this point. And Scully urges Invisigoth to put the CD in, destroy the AI once and for all, mm-hmm. and she does. Um, takes a little bit of convincing, but she does. And as Scully's unhooks Mulder and he's sort of very withered he's weak he doesn't really know where he is Mm. she manages to sort of drag him out as she goes back in the missile starts heading towards the caravan again and she's trying to get um, Invisigoth out she says no just carry on and she's tapping away at the at the laptop Mm -hmm. Um, so Scully decides I've got to get Mulder away she does try again but it doesn't to no avail she gets Mulder away a, um, a missile hits the caravan, but the second before that happens, we see that Invisigoth has, or Esther, has hooked herself up to the VR machine that um, Mulder was in. And what we can assume is her and David are now, well, like they always planned, uploaded into this AI program, yeah. which <clears throat> you would also assume that means she hasn't killed the AI program. Yeah, um, it, it's kind of one of those things where you don't know if the AI is sort of won over these two, or if the two of them have sort of managed to overpower the AI or sort of subvert it in some way, it, 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 a lot of it's left unanswered, which, to be honest, I think is probably the best um, yeah. sort of outcome. Like if, you, if you've thought about this episode too much, there's so many holes, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't need to, though. No. And there was... Like, I, fig- I figure that they she's made a choice. This is my personal theory. I figure she's made a choice to let the AI live so that her and David could be together. Mm-hmm. Because when she starts typing away, the missile starts going again, mm-hmm. which to me says the AI is still going. Yeah, and it's not true. been terminated. Yeah. Um, and later on, we do get a scene with these kids sort of playing football and this old caravan in the caravan park with the camera moving and watching them, which I think the AI is still about. Just the nice thing and the nice thing to take away from this story is that Esther and David, hopefully, if, if it works, we don't actually have a clue that it actually works. Yeah. But if it works, they've their consciousness has been uploaded into this whatever program it is. Yeah, I mean, not a lot's explained, but like I said, from from what I took from it, is that it was a kind of happy ending. That yeah, they sort of did get to live on forever in this program. So, and hopefully, nothing bad happens from that. But <laughs> I don't. I it kind I'm of. I'm like, both of his hands back. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the. By good the thing, way. So. The, the, the effects for his arms, that was fantastic. Yeah, it was really good. I don't know how they've done that, but it looked amazing. Yeah, it really did. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say on that, on that one. But... Well, t- I'll tell you what you can say. You can yeah. give us a, a succinct review of the entire episode as a whole. So, yeah, as as we said early at the beginning, um, I think I was wrong about this. This is not one of the worst episodes of the series. Definitely not. I think it's... Easily up there with one of the best. I, I absolutely loved it. Um, I've thought that, they, that as I mentioned, that one-off character, uh, Invisigoth or e- Esther, um, I thought she was absolutely brilliant as a one-off character. It's like a fully realised, well-written character. Um, yeah, with all that kind of Sarah Connor attitude, but also this sympathetic story as well to sort of make you realise her motivations. I thought Mulder and Scully in their separate roles as well were really great. Uh, Mulder for sort of being sort of the vector for this weird VR scene. Um, And Scully just as a badass, both uh, in the real world and the VR world. Um, 
just a really well written detective story that had this sci-fi link and yeah uh, I absolutely loved it uh, and I was really surprised <laughs> coming away from it yeah I thought this was a lot of fun yeah. I really did I really enjoyed it it was exactly what it needed to be in the sense of for me it, a lot of these action films get, I, I'm thinking like um, I'm thinking like Predator I'm thinking like Rambo and stuff like that You've you've got a lot of that in here which is it, if it takes itself too seriously, it doesn't work, but this never does. It never feels like it takes itself seriously. Mm. The, the very inclusion of the lone gunman gives it that levity. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. it helps it to work. Um, and because it doesn't take itself too seriously, it actually is more impactful when there's a serious point to be made. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed it. I, and I, I, I did wonder whether I was I enjoyed it more because... You, you mentioned last week that you, you thought it might not be a good episode. And I thought, oh, maybe it's just my expectations were really low. But I don't think it is. I think I just genuinely really enjoyed the episode, yeah. yeah. I, it's it's weird as well, isn't it, that this was written by another author uh, and we've come away from this so much more positively than one by one of the biggest authors in the world. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's true. It's, it's strange. We, one, like a week after the other, so... Yeah. I wonder whether this author had as many rewrites <laughs> as um, Stephen King got. Yeah, uh, well, we can find out in some production notes. <laughs> Luke's production notes. The episode was written by acclaimed cyberpunk novelist William Gibson, together with fellow science fiction author Tom Maddox. So uh, he's also an author, but I, I hadn't really heard his name before. Um, mm. Apparently, the authors uh, and longtime friends had discussed various collaborations before and approached the produ- production company with an, with an offer to write an episode. So, yeah, interesting that they should come to them. Uh, it, it seems like that's the way for the authors. They, they, they want to get involved with it, so... It really shows just how big in the sort of public zeitgeist X Files was at this time. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And um, again, it's one of those things that we'll never really truly understand because yeah. X Files, as as far as I've ever been aware of it, has always been a cult mm. um, show. Like, like so I, I wasn't old enough when it first, came, especially not when it started, mm. to sort of have any uh, idea of it. And it kind of always falls into sort of. I know I've mentioned this this before, but it kind of always fall, fell into like the Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, mode for me, where yeah. it was like those two shows. I remember people, and I remember people at school, and it was never me. I don't know why, but I remember people at school going back and watching it every Wednesday night or every Thursday or whenever it was on. Um, and I specifically remember um, a lot of like family, like older family members doing that as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. Um, but because I missed the train on it, it's always been a cult show to me. And yeah. so it's always had this sort of bigger aura around it. But it's interesting to see, like you said now, that when did it come in? Because when did it suddenly click that all these famous writers went, actually, I really want to be involved in this? Yeah, yeah. Um, Gibson originally started watching the series on the suggestion of his daughter, uh, 15 years old at the time. Uh, during the filming of Killswitch, Gibson spent a majority of his time on the set only because his daughter insisted on being there. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, Killswitch deals with uh, re- recurrent Gibsonian themes. Uh, I love it when writers have their own, like, uh, uh, so like Orwellian, which is quite big in the news <laughs> recently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what would yours be? Uh, Costinian themes, yeah. My Costinian themes. Um, uh, I've not written anything, so I don't know. (laughs) Oh, that's a shame. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. Maybe like uh, wacky and um, oppressive. Nice, I like it. Yeah, wacky, oppressive. That that that's your that's your genre. It's like 1984, but if it was filtered through like Noel Fielding. That's my. That's what I want to go for. You read 1984, and you just like close the book. Ugh, needed more jokes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God, laugh. Why don't you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> but there is a film basically that Brazil is basically 1984, <laughs> but with a few more laughs till the end. Until the end, anyway. Um, anyway. Um, 
So yeah, it deals with recurrent Gibsonian themes like alienation, paranoia, and the will to survive. Uh, The Vancouver Sun author Alex Strachan uh, later compared many of the episode themes to that of Gibson's books, most notably his novels Neuromancer, Mona Lisa Overdrive, and Virtual Light. So there you go, some reading suggestions. I've yeah. never read any of those, but I'm interested to have a look at them. Yeah, I've heard of Neuromancer, but yeah, the other two, pff, not a clue. Um, written outside of the Mythos arc of the series, as a standalone story, Kill Switch was penned to be reminiscent of the dark visions of filmmaker... David Cronenberg, and to contain many obvious pokes and prods at high-end acadi- uh, God, academic cyberculture. Um, the episode also revolves around the interaction of humans and artificial intelligence on the we- World Wide Web, ideas that were very popular when the episode was written. So yeah, uh, I feel like that was kind of being like the... the um, yeah, the, the, the idea of the time. Everything was like about the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Reportedly, it took over a year before the episode was rewritten and completed due to uh, to series creator Chris Carter and executive producer Frank Spotnitz of her priorities. Uh, when they were finally available, Carter and Spotnitz made some revisions to the, to the script, including upping the attitude of Esther's character and tweaking the way Mulder and Scully reacted to her. So it seems like the attitude was a, uh, a note from the creators. Okay, interesting. Um... According to Spotnitz, Kill Switch was the most expensive episode that the show produced during its original run in Vancouver, and it took 22 days to film. So it's, uh, I did, as soon as I saw that explosion, I was like, they've, they've put a pretty penny into this. Yeah, you don't see explosions too often in X-Files. Not like that, no. certainly not like that. <laughs> um, they had two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And the remnants of another, so... <laughs> they really went all out on their explosion budget. Um, so everything else this se- series is just going to be like very dull. There's going to be no more explosions. <laughs> um, the episode's bridge scenes were filmed at the Western Island Bridge, which spans the Canoe Pass in British Columbia. The location had been discovered by Carter during a technical survey for the prior episode, Skits- Skits- oh, God, I can never say this one, Schizogeny. Uh because the bridge was uh, the only way to access part of the Fraser River community, filming was heavily regulated, and because of this, permission to film the scene in which Esther throws the laptop into the ri- river required 30 days to obtain. Um, I always think of scenes like that, and I always think to myself, is it worth it? Is it Was it worth <laughs> it for that scene? Could you not just do it on a normal bridge? Um, and obviously there's a reason, and they've got a vision in mind of what they wanted to do. But I look at that scene, I'm just like... I, does that like two minutes angle of them sort of having to get onto the turning bridge? Does that make that bigger difference to the story? Do you know what? Maybe that's the difference between us and X Files directors. You know good point. I mean? Very yeah. good point. Maybe they know a lot more than I do, so I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> we're more like the executives behind this. Can we not get this cheaper? <laughs> <laughs> um, apparently, the abandoned house that Mulder uh, discovers. Um, was filmed at a historic landmark known as the Reed House. So there you go. I'm Ooh. guessing the house is, they mean trailer uh, from that notes, but... Yeah, I've yeah. got no idea. Um, the episode containing several scenes... Uh, the episode contains several scenes featuring elaborate explosions, as we mentioned, such as the one featuring a missile destroying a shipping container. After the city rescinded permission to film, special effects crew for the X-Files uh, shipped as many containers as they could to a recycling centre in the adjacent city of Burnaby. Uh, here they were able to film the explosion without a hitch. Mm. Well, I mean, again, the fact that they put all this budget into this episode, I'm very happy. Because again, it, I think it just it definitely added to that whole drama of it. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, it just felt more film-like, and it definitely feels like, uh, we know obviously at the end of this series we have a feature film, and it feels like they're definitely testing their chops, <laughs> you know what I mean? I've never actually thought of it like that, but yeah, yeah you're probably right, you know, that they, they must have known they had they had a film at this point. Yeah, yeah, so there's, I, I do feel like there's purpose to it, it's sort of building up to this sort of big event, I guess. Um. The destruction of the trailer was filmed adjacent to the Boundary Bay Airport, and afterwards, the series received several complaints from people living nearby complaining about the explosion and its resultant shockwave. 
Um, what a bunch of bores. Um, imagine if your windows got taken out by uh, a, a filming of the X-Files nearby. Uh, I don't know. That's I'd, a good point, yeah. yeah. I'd be annoyed, but also like, oh, that is pretty cool, to be fair. <laughs> There's, um... Oh, um... Jam watches, um... Um, Mythbusters. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was an episode of Mythbusters um, that they're firing... Because um, uh, uh, Mythbusters, everyone knows what Mythbusters is, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I assume. So they're firing a cannon. They're trying to figure out, like, whether a cannonball would take down structures, so specific structures or anything like that. I'm not sure. Anyway, they misfired it. They took it to, like, this sort of quarry, and they misfired it, and then... Th- it basically bounced through this entire community, took, taking out like five or six different houses along the God. way. Um, and I just uh, imagine that. Imagine you just sat in your front room and a cannonball comes it's, through your, your wall. It's surprising no one was hurt. I don't think anyone was hurt. And I, I, if I remember correctly, like they put like, this big apology out, and I think they um, did a load of fundraising and sort of gave back to the community yeah. and helped rebuild houses and stuff like that. But like, yeah, it's it's similar type of thing. It just. Because it's just a freak thing that you yeah. wouldn't expect in the middle of the day, do you know what I mean? Yeah, just sat there reading the paper and a cannonball crashes through A cannonball? Window. An actual cannonball <laughs> in, like, what, Shit. 2000? Yeah. Like, oh, God, we're back in a civil war. <laughs> <laughs> They've come back to cannons. <laughs> um, the show hired a freelance computer artist to generate a 3D image of Scully for the scene in which she fights off a group of nurses in a virtual hospital. Gillian Anderson was very pleased with the scene, later noting, uh, I happened to be in good shape at the time and was just raring to get in there uh, and be taking those half-naked nurses out with some karate chops. David Duchovny was not as exuberant. When showed the script and directed to be impressed with Scully's karate skills, he responded that, but I have no arms. I've lost my arms. Why would I care about Scully's karate? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good point. It's so true. <laughs> I can I can't imagine him being shocked at losing his arms, and then like a smile comes on his face, oh. and he's like, "Oh, look at these karate Man, moves. She can do some chops." <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> oh. Um. And finally, uh, the episode's name has also been said to inspire the name of the American metalcore band Kill Switch Engage. Oh so, yeah. wow! Okay. So for for all of you, I, I get the feeling Jem will be uh, interested by that fact. <laughs> I don't think she likes. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe oh, really? she does. I can't remember. To be honest, I don't, but, I don't, really, I, I don't think I could tell you a song. The Kill Switches. <laughs> uh, I was big into them back when I was into Kerrang as a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that's the production notes, so uh, let's go on to some critics files. It stinks. Welcome to the critics files. What would you rate this episode? I'm going to give this a solid eight. An eight. I was very, ho- very okay. good episode. I really enjoyed it. I was hovering around an eight, and I was like. I think I enjoyed it more for, more than that. I have to give it a nine. I was a nine. I was wow, really wow, impressed wow. with it. Yeah. Um, with uh, two thousand eight hundred ninety four votes, uh, IMDb gave it an eight on the dot. So, oh, there you go. Have, has that ever happened? Has we, have we ever got it one on the dot? Uh, I don't remember seeing a a, a full, yeah, a non fractional number. Beautiful, <laughs> yeah, and, so. and as I say, it matches matches with ours as well. Or what mine? Uh, and just a final note on critics' feelings on it: the uh, Kill Switch actually earned an Emmy Award uh, by the Academy of Television Arts and Science for outstanding picture editing in a series. So there you go, mm. Emmy Emmy Award winning. There so it's go. got it's got some prestige as well, which is good. I'm glad. Um. Yeah, perfect. A good episode this week. Really enjoyed watching it, and really enjoyed going going through it with you. Um, next week we'll be looking at um episode twelve of season five, which is titled "Bad Blood." Bad Blood, yeah. Um. So I'm looking forward to going through that. You in the it. meantime, you can get in touch with us. Um. Just search for Most Unwanted Podcast or Most Unwanted Pod on any social media. You will probably find us. Um, Twitter's the best one I'd say um, 
But yeah, for now, it's, it's bye from us, and we'll see you next week for Bad Blood. start it's a very strange start we basically get this amalgamation am- amal- how do you say that word <laughs> amalgamation is it <laughs> amalgamation <laughs> i can't spell it though right in the note then so <laughs> um, we basically <laughs> <laughs> this That's... is usually you this is me <laughs> My earliest memory of using the internet. So, I'm wondering... Holy shit, sorry. Just at the corner of my eye, I just saw a massive fire over it. It's like... <laughs> Dad, it, wait, now, are we talking about, like, a back garden fire? Or yeah. is a house on fire? Yeah, yeah, like a back garden fire. But they, they seem to put so much cardboard on it that it looks like the entire hedge is on fire. Um, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Our neighbours are smart people. Uh, anyway, <laughs> getting back to it. Um, 